This is Christina Ha, and you're watching The Unblinking Eye. From Dutch days to World War II, the maritime port was crucial to New York City. And then slowly, the shipping traffic began moving towards New Jersey. Why is this? Will some of those boats be coming back? Should they come back? And how crucial will harbor development be to the region's future? These were a few of the questions raised at a Gotham Center for New York City History Forum called History and Prospects of the Maritime Port, held at the CUNY Graduate Center in Manhattan. Panelists reviewed major events in the port's history and discussed potential future developments which could affect the area's economy and ecology. The forum began with a quick summary of the history of the port. As we look at the present and the future of the port tonight, uh, I think it's worth bearing in mind some persistent or at least recurrent themes and issues in the port's history. Ports are profoundly places about place and space. And over the centuries, the Port of New York has raised recurrent questions. Is there a harbor where I can safely dock my ship? Is there enough space between the water's surface and the bottom of the harbor to get the vessel over it? If not, what are we going to do about that? Is there enough lateral space between vessels and piers and enough elbow room to maneuver vessels around one another? Is there enough space on land to load and, and unload goods and to move goods in and out? And to turn that question inside out, which parts of the port get to enjoy the privilege of the economic benefits arising from pier and warehouse development? Are there enough piers? And are they in good enough shape so as not to propel cargo and people directly into the East River, the Hudson River, or the Upper Bay? These questions have shaped and reshaped the changing history of the Port of New York as maritime technologies and the imperatives of maritime traffic and trade have changed. The original Port of New York, really the Port of New Amsterdam, the Dutch Port, founded in 1624, was on the East River waterfront of Lower Manhattan. That was its center of gravity. For over 200 years, this, the uh, East River waterfront, which eventually became South Street, was the port center of gravity, the place where New York became the nation's dominant port, a place by the 19th century of transatlantic and coastal sailing packets, China traders and cotton traders, Erie Canal barges, immigrant ships, and early steamboats. The success of that port led to the shifting and expanding of its center of gravity by the 1840s, 50s, and 60s. This entailed the spread of docks and port facilities around the edge of the harbor to Brooklyn, Manhattan's west side, and across the Hudson to Hoboken and Jersey City, as well as Staten Island. In 1898, the city of Greater New York was consolidated in part to unify control and planning for this port shared by the five boroughs, and by the 1920s, New York, along with the New Jersey side of the harbor, was the world's busiest port, not merely the nation's. And I would end simply by saying uh, more generally that given the matters at hand today in terms of uh, the shift of the port and its critical mass into Newark Bay and the container port, um, to me one of the most interesting questions for historians is what difference does it make if you envision the port of New York uh, as an economic organism and a transportation organism which encompasses also New Jersey, not only five boroughs, not only Manhattan but f and five boroughs, but two states, New York and New Jersey on either side of the harbor from a very early date, really uh, uh, arguably from the early and mid 19th century. So I leave you with that thought and hopefully we'll be able to discuss some of these issues uh, later on. Thank you. I'm Jim Doig, and I'm uh, to take up the question of the role of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Um, it's, a, it's an activity that's gone on now for 80 years. And I think what I'll do, uh, given the time constraints, uh, is to focus on just two uh, periods in which the Port Authority's efforts uh, were significant with regard to the set of maritime issues that we're addressing tonight. Uh, we first go back to World War I. In 1914, 15, 16, as the war began in Europe and uh, as, uh, as we began to uh, join in uh, goods to be sent overseas uh, for the Allies, uh, the Port Authority, I should say the Port of New York at that time, uh, it was the, uh, the shipping center uh, 
from uh, all parts of the United States to Europe for about 90% of our international uh, trade. So it was clearly the dominant uh, source of goods flowing from here to Europe, also indeed flowing out and down to uh, Latin America. But World War I put a terrific uh, uh, pressure on the facilities here. There was a continual breakdown uh, in the ability to get the goods uh, out across to Europe, and later when we joined uh, the uh, World War I in 1917 to get the troops out as well. And the main problem was that 10 of the 12 railroads that came from across the country into the New York region stopped uh, in New Jersey at the Hudson River shore. Then the goods were offloaded onto lighters and, uh, and barges and were floated across to the Manhattan and Brooklyn piers, and then they were reloaded onto ships and then taken uh, out uh, across the seas. Uh, as you began to build up more and more traffic coming into the port under the demands of the First World War, uh, this system broke down. There were times in 1916 and early 1917 in which the freight cars were backed up from the New Jersey shore through New Jersey into Pennsylvania as far west as Pittsburgh. So you can see that that, uh, that suggested uh, to, uh, uh, to both uh, government officials and others that something needed to be done to make the port uh, more efficient. Well, the physical solution that was generally thought to be uh, most successful was to put a tunnel under New York Bay going from Jersey City uh, into Brooklyn, uh, which would allow the freight trains from around the country to pass under New York Bay and then to deliver uh, the goods directly to the piers in Brooklyn, and then there would be a shorter uh, back uh, haul across the East River for uh, many of the uh, Manhattan piers. But because the two states, the, the, because there were two states involved, you had the, uh, the New Jersey where you had all the rail lines and then you had uh, New York with all the shipping piers or almost all of them, it seemed uh, desirable to set up a new organization, one that could in fact work out a detailed plan, then get agreement, and then go forward with the uh, magic solution of the rail tunnel. And that new organization, created finally in April 1921, was the Port of New York Authority, uh, run jointly by commissioners appointed by the governor of New York and by the governor of New Jersey. Uh, the Port Authority was established over the vehement uh, objections of the elected officials of New York City, led by John Hyland, who was then the mayor, uh, and they sued to prevent the Port Authority from being established, their argument being that uh, the Port of New York uh, had, uh, had been built and, th and had thrived under the uh, efforts of New York City since the 1870s. Why should control over this area, this important part of New York's history and its future, uh, be given over to a bi-state agency, especially one in which New York City officials would have no uh, central role? Well, the Port Authority then established in 1921, developed the detailed plan, and then it went to the railroads and asked them to join in in providing support and guarantees that they would use this new rail tunnel rather than floating their goods inefficiently across the harbor. Every one of the railroads uh, declined to take part. Uh, they were quite suspicious of each other because each of them felt that if they used their own system, their own method of floating uh, goods or otherwise getting them to the piers and the ships, they would get more traffic than their competitors, but they're even more suspicious of the Port Authority, which they viewed as an effort to bring governmental control into an area in which they felt that market competition uh, was the most beneficial way to proceed. By the end of the 1920s, the Port Authority's plans had all uh, collapsed. The Port Authority itself had nearly collapsed, uh, and the railroads went on into the 1930s, in which all of them went into bankruptcy in the Depression. The Port Authority, though, was saved. It was saved because of a change in technology. That is, freight began increasingly in the late 20s to travel by truck. And the Port Authority had fortuitously built the George Washington Bridge. It was completed in 1931, but they were building it during this period. Uh, they took over uh, the Holland Tunnel. They then built the Lincoln Tunnel. And therefore, trucks could carry the goods across to the, uh, to the piers of uh, of Brooklyn and Manhattan from across the country, and temporarily and partially then, by the 1930s, the problem of getting your freight across to the, sh to the ships and then out to the world had been solved by the advent of the trucks and by the uh, beneficial activities in terms of the trucks, 
of the Port Authority in building and, uh, and running the, uh, the George Washington Bridge and the Holland and Lincoln Tunnel. Well, that's the end of the first uh, stage, the kind of Port Authority's efforts which then failed. And of course, it's an effort which has now been revived, uh, in part due to the strong efforts of, uh, of uh, a member of our panel who will speak next. Let me jump ahead, though, to the mid-1950s. Here we have the Port Authority, uh, which uh, had used the profits uh, that it obtained from the George Washington Bridge and the Lincoln and Holland Tunnel uh, to take over and modernize Port Newark. Uh, it took uh, over Port Newark in 1947. Uh, it also made an offer to New York City to take control of and modernize the piers of uh, Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, the Board of Estimate, the city's governing body, rejected that offer twice in 1949 and 1950. Uh, the Port Authority, though, did have control over Port Newark. Uh, its officials were insulated from the city fathers of Newark, and they could make decisions without regard to what either the voters or the elected officials of Newark uh, wished. They also had recruited a staff that I refer to in, in, uh, in my book as, uh, as entrepreneurial, that is willing to try uh, new technological approaches, willing to, uh, to take uh, risks, willing to engage in risk-taking behavior. And in 1955, they teamed up with a trucking executive whose name was Malcolm McLean and built the first uh, container ship uh, and lifted Malcolm McLean's trucks onto it and then carried them from there down to Puerto Rico. They then uh, negotiated with the head of the Port of Oakland, which had a similar kind of independence to create a pier that could receive the containers there, and they then went to Oakland and then to Rotterdam, finally. So during 1955, six, seven, and eight, uh, they had uh, expanded, they had built a, the basis of a container uh, operation uh, in, in Newark, and then they later expanded uh, to Elizabeth. A container operation uh, requires, as the previous speaker suggested, vast acres of upland space for stacking and storing the containers, um, and Brooklyn and Manhattan did not have uh, that space, nor did they have entrepreneurial officials in charge of their, of their ports and terminals uh, building. Uh, as a result, uh, Port Newark and then Elizabeth uh, expanded and thrived, and the uh, ports of Brooklyn and Manhattan declined. It was not perhaps the Port Authority's fault, uh, but rather the result of a new technology that New York's piers and its maritime traffic uh, fell away. But it was possible for politicians to blame the Port Authority that made good press, and the mayors of New York City in the 1960s and 70s and since did blame the Port Authority uh, for the failures in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and disregarded also the city's own earlier reluctance to uh, have the Port Authority modernize their own uh, piers. Much the same pattern, that is the relative strength of Newark and Elizabeth, has continued to the end of the 20th century and into the current century, though the dredging issue, which we'll speak about further, I'm sure, uh, raise again the question of whether New York's piers, uh, which do not suffer the same problems of buildup of sentiment as Port Newark and Elizabeth do, uh, may have a more vigorous future in the 21st century. The uh, Port of New York did not grow automatically it was a result of some far-sighted decisions by some far-sighted uh, governmental leaders in the early part of the 19th century, specifically DeWitt Clinton, who understood the necessity for infrastructure. In this century, we've uh, rested on our laurels, and we have declined in market share for the last 20 or 30 years as a result. We're the only major city in North America, a major port city, that didn't build a rail freight tunnel or bridge under or over its harbor or river, and that was one of the major uh, problems. In order to accommodate the current container revolution, you need two things. You need the proper depth in the harbor to get the 50-foot deep ships through, which are the next generation of ships, and you need the landside access so that the container doesn't get taken off the ship by a crane, put on a truck chassis, the truck go out the gate of the terminal and stop in the deadliest traffic in the world on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, the court, and we have a crisis coming up now. Currently, the Port of New York and New Jersey combined, and whenever I say the port, I mean both, is doing about 2.5 million TEUs, 20-foot equivalent units, it's a measurement, uh, a year. 
the shipping companies are following the airlines, and they are going to a hub and feeder port system, where most, almost all transatlantic, transoceanic shipments are going to come into one hub port on the eastern seaboard, one hub port in northern Europe, Rotterdam, and uh, it'll go north and south and west from there by truck, train, barge, smaller ship, whatever. Port Authority study of 1995 said that if New York did not become the hub port, we would lose 40 percent of our existing uh, two and a half million TEUs and of our existing 180,000 port-related jobs. New York City EDC study and Port Authority studies of 1997 said that if we became the hub port, we could go from 2.2 million TEUs to uh, now 2.5 million TEUs now to 10 million in 2020 and as much as, seven, as 14 to 17 million in 2040. So we have a stark choice. Cut our job base in half by 40 percent or septuple it. That's the choice. How do we become the hub port? We are in competition with Norfolk and Halifax to be the hub port on the eastern seaboard. In Southeast Asia, Hong Kong and Singapore are spending billions of dollars in investments and in speculative investments to become the hub port because they both won't win. We know who will win the competition if we will get our act straight. We will because we have tremendous natural advantages over Halifax and Norfolk specifically. We, New York that is, New York, New Jersey, are at the center of the megalopolis on the East Coast that stretches from Richmond, Virginia to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Halifax, I'm sorry, um, uh, Norfolk is at the bottom end. Halifax is way up in the hinterlands up north. Second, we have a 35 million person, 35 million population regional market. Norfolk's regional market is a couple million. Halifax essentially doesn't have a regional market. Those are our two major advantages. The reason we will lose to either Halifax or Norfolk is that you cannot get a 50-foot ship, 50-foot deep ship, and land anywhere in New York Harbor or Newark Bay today, take those uh, containers off the ship and get it down to a railroad and go anyplace. Doesn't exist. And that's why we need the rail, but I'll come back to that in a minute. Now, our port now is in Newark. Our major port is in Newark Bay. Newark, Elizabeth, Howland, Hook, and Staten Island. Newark Bay. Newark Bay is on the wrong side of the Kilvan Cull. Narrow, treacherous body of water you see separating Staten Island in the south from Bayonne in the north. The problem with the Kilvan Cull and Newark Bay is that, it's, is that you hit solid rock at 35 feet. We have recently spent half a billion dollars blasting, the word dredging is usually used, I prefer blasting, it's more descriptive, but dredging also means just pushing the silt out of the way. A lot of confusion is caused when, caused when you use one word to mean two different things. We've spent half a billion dollars in eight years blasting the kill down to 40 feet. Now the idea is to spend about two billion dollars to blast it down to 50 feet. The problem is that'll take at least 15 years by which time the hub port will be well settled in Halifax or Norfolk. The solution to that problem is that we, and I'm not saying we shouldn't blast the kill, we should, but we've got to get 50 foot capability as quickly as possible so that we get the hub port here. And the way to do that is to use New York Harbor. New York Harbor, you don't hit solid rock until 100, 150 feet in the channel and 60 to 65 feet deep at the pier head line. Where in New York Harbor? Two places are rational. They own and Brooklyn. Bayonne, the Port Authority wants to do it. They finally admitted after years of denial the necessity of bringing part of the port into New York Harbor and maybe they will and maybe they won't depending on the politics of Union County and Jersey City be able to make a container port in, New, in, uh, in uh, Bayonne by 2010. I have my doubts that they'll be able to do it. Brooklyn, Sunset Park, you could have a container port tomorrow as far as the depth is needed, is concerned. The city has plans, the city administration, which has been very intelligent on this, has plans to develop a 350 acre container port over the next 20 years, but it can be open quit more quickly and Connie will tell you about how it can be open even more quickly than the city's plans. But we do need a tunnel because now there is some question, Connie has some question as to whether we need a tunnel but I, for this, but I think we do. Um, 
because the, the extra truck traffic, which would otherwise be necessary to handle all the containers coming off the port, would clog and possibly the Brooklyn roads. So we must have the rail freight tunnel to get exactly for the reasons that were stated before, and in particular to get the stuff from the Brooklyn port out, uh, out of the Brooklyn port. Now, there's another reason we need the rail freight tunnel, which has nothing to do with the port, and that is that 40 percent of intercity freight in the United States goes by rail. But in New York City, Long Island, Westchester, Putnam counties, and the state of Connecticut, the figure isn't 40 percent. It's 2.5 to 2.8 percent. The almost total dependence on trucking, we're the only city on the continent where everything comes in and goes out by truck, the almost total dependence on trucking pollutes our air. It's one of the reasons we have the highest asthma rates in the world. Congests our streets, uh, tears the heck out of our streets and the water mains below. Um, adds a, probably a dime to the cost of every grapefruit you buy, adds to the cost of every consumer good, and adds to the cost of doing business and puts an upward limit on economic development in this whole East of the Hudson region. Now, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the key reasons for that is the lack of any way of crossing the Hudson by rail for rail freight purposes below a bridge 140 miles north of here at Selkirk. That 280-mile Selkirk hurdle is uh, uh, extremely uh, uneconomical in terms of rail freight. So to get rail freight back into this whole region, we need the tunnel, as well as to make a port in Brooklyn practical, we need the tunnel. The recent study by the EDC uh, said that a tunnel, rail freight tunnel that is currently being talked about would cost uh, $1.8 billion to develop. You need another half a billion dollars to get your rail freight network into general, generally good shape around it. Uh, the cost to benefit, the economic benefits to the region without the port would be $420 million a year. The benefit to cost ratio would be two and a half to one. Uh, anything over one to one, you usually say do it immediately. Uh, two and a half to one benefit to cost ratio. All of this without considering the port. And again, as I said, if we want to win the race with Halifax and Norfolk to get the hub port here so that we can continue our job base and continue the centrality of the port to the to the economy that it's always been. The city grew up around the port. Um, we have to become the hub port, and to do that, we need to get the 50-foot ships in here. Uh, and to get the 50-foot sh ships in here, we can't wait to bless the kill. The only way is to have the port in Brooklyn, and the only way to, and the best way to do that, perhaps the only way, is with the tunnel. So for all these reasons, you need the rail freight tunnel, and we certainly need that port development here in Brooklyn. The Port Authority, at this point, uh, I'm sorry Chris isn't here to debate. The Port Authority uh, finally admitted after years, I, I will say one funny thing, despite the 10 seconds, I, I will say that we've had a long-running debate with the Port Authority over the need to make the port fit for 50-foot ships. I remember debating with one high official at the Port Authority 10 years ago, I won't name her, in which, um, <laughs> or, I'm, in which uh, this person said, um, um, 45 feet is all we're going to need. The ships aren't going to get any deeper. And I remember saying, you know, the ships have been getting deeper since Pharaoh. They're not stopping now. Um, the Port Authority has recognized the need for 50 feet, finally. Um, but it has not recognized the necessity to do it in the Brooklyn as well as the, the, the New Jersey side of the harbor. Thank you very much. I think what he said, what the congressman said, and what you have just heard points to the need to act. Act now. If we were to move right away on the tunnel and start designing it and then building it and constructing it, it is still a major construction job which is going to take, what, seven to eight, maybe ten years. It could be fast-tracked, but whatever it is, it's a long time. <clears throat> Meanwhile, the ships are on order, are coming into service, and they will go somewhere. What I just heard about a week ago, which surprised me, is that Norfolk has decided internally that they will now go down to a 60-foot depth. Now, you know what that means. That means that we have to figure out how to counter that in the long run. However, we have some tremendously unused assets. Brooklyn is one. Bayonne is another. The extraordinary thing about Brooklyn, in one respect, is a line which probably most of you have never heard of. It's called the Bay Ridge Line. 
It goes from the 65th Street float bridge area, from essentially the Brooklyn Army Terminal, to Fresh Pond Junction, at which point you can go north over the Hellgate Bridge, on up to Boston, New Haven, on up to Albany or out west, and you can access all Long Island. That was once a major four-track railroad serving the, the bustling Brooklyn ports that handled all that traffic from World War I and World War II. To put a port in Brooklyn, you do not need to blast. <clears throat> the depths are at least 65 feet before you hit rock. So you have a, the, a natural system in place. There are a lot of people around this uh, world who don't think that ports are very important. In, indeed, uh, you know, why should we worry as to whether or not this, this city of ours or this region of ours remains a hub port region? Why not let all that commerce go down to New Orleans or up to Halifax and help them out up there? Jobs, my friends, jobs and our economic base. We need to do these things. We can do them. It's probably our last shot, but we have a terrific asset right here in the geography of the city of New York and the port of New York. There are, there are two ferry routes that I'm showing you here, just as an idea. Uh, my purpose in raising this, incidentally, isn't that you should adopt it, but that I think that New York's genius has been its entrepreneurial spirit. It's Jeremiah Thompson's, it's uh, Constantine Cinnamon Aristotle's, it's Jerry Nadler's, the people who have brought forth new ideas. And these are the, the kind of thinking that we need. So we're just trying to prime the pump a little. <clears throat> There's two ideas here. One is to connect the burgeoning areas where development is occurring with local ferry service. This is Christina Ha, and you're watching The Unblinking Eye. Over the past half hour, you've been watching a seminar on the history and potential future of the maritime port in New York. The forum was part of CUNY's Gotham Center History Series, held at the Graduate Center in Manhattan. As we return to the forum, the discussion is turning to the ecological impacts related to shipping activity in the port. We've heard a lot about the history of the port and the future of the port. I happen to be a strong proponent of continued economic development of the port. Um, free uh, uh, growth in world trade is uh, important. Uh, it's important for the welfare of not only our country but the world, and I think ultimately uh, for the good of the environment of the world. Um, so I think uh, for a variety of reasons, or I hope that the port will uh, continue to expand and thrive and grow. Um, but uh, that aside, uh, let me give you sort of a short history of the environment of our estuary. The port that we've been talking about um, has been built and thrived in an estuary known as the Hudson Raritan Estuary. It's an extraordinary estuary, um, not only having spurred all this economic growth, uh, but from an environmental point of view in terms of its biological production, fisheries, and so on. Um, but it has changed tremendously over the last 300 years, uh, and certainly in the last 50 years. We've heard about uh, navigation channels all over the place, and the proposal uh, to deepen a lot of those channels to 50 feet. Um, the estuary has gradually been deepened. There are now proposals to deepen it even more in these navigation channels. That's an unnatural phenomenon. It alters the bathymetry, the shape of the estuary, and the flow of water, and so on. Um, at the same time, the wetlands uh, that used to fringe uh, all, all of the boroughs in New Jersey and so on uh, have gradually been filled. So there's been in this, um, uh, in this city and in this region, we've lost about 80% of our coastal uh, wetlands. Um, so when we think about the continued expansion of ports wherever it is, uh, one of the things we have to think about is um, what that is going to mean for those existing uh, wetland systems. Um, pollutants have been discharged into the estuary, um, and it certainly accelerated with the industrialization that took place in the city uh, after uh, the Civil War. Uh, this was a major center of manufacturing, of industry, um, and for all intents and purposes, the discharge of industrial pollutants uh, was not regulated in any meaningful way until around the late uh, 1960s and then federal laws that began in um, the early 1970s. Uh, 
uh, and since that time there's been some effort to do it. Um, what is the environmental agenda um, that is, in, should be linked, so to speak, uh, to the development of the port? Um, one is um, we should protect our remaining wetlands. That means in a lot of cases buying them. Um, there are major wetlands, particularly in the Hackensack Meadowlands, where there are big warehouses, some of which service the port, that we need to uh, protect. There are wetlands along Arthur Hill and so on, and uh, riverine headwaters that we need to protect. And the cost of doing that will be very considerable because any kind of land here, even wetlands, uh, uh, is expensive. Um, two, um, Inevitably, some of the channels will be deepened. Whether they all have to be deepened to 50 feet or eventually to 60 feet is another uh, question, but some will be deepened. But there is an open question as to to what degree um, the terminal facilities themselves will have to be expanded to accommodate this increase in growth um, in, in cargo traffic. If terminals have to expand, there's going to be more filling. Um, and from an environmental point of view, that's undesirable. You're either going to be filling wetlands in some cases or shallow water uh, habitat. So the question is, is there a technological solution to that? Can you increase the productivity of the existing land, whether we're talking about Brooklyn or Bayonne or Newark, um, so that more goods can move more quickly um, uh, through those facilities? Uh, and actually, it appears that uh, certain kinds of rail technologies and, and barge technologies can probably enhance that productivity uh, significantly. Um, can we clean up our sediments, keep contaminants out, so that when, whenever we do dredge, we don't have to be concerned about moving contaminants either out into the ocean or into upland sites uh, um, or wherever? Um, well, that has to become a major agenda for the, for the port and for the region, for that matter. Can we clean up the Superfund sites? Um, there is an effort underway to sort of look at all this, but again, the cost is going to be considerable. If you look at the cost of trying to clean up the sediments of the Passaic River, we're talking about uh, easily a billion dollars. Uh, in terms of the transportation system, what is the environmental agenda? The environmental agenda uh, has to be, given sort of current technologies, um, to shift a significant amount of the uh, growing port traffic, and indeed all goods moving through this region, to rail or water. Um, we've heard about the tunnel um, and the Bay Ridge Line. The Bay Ridge Line now, I think, carries something like 6,000 rail cars a year. And historically, I think it was 600,000 rail cars uh, a, a year. But there is an existing infrastructure system in place here in terms of the existing rail system, uh, absent the, the tunnel, and the water system where we can carry more goods uh, efficiently with less pollution, less air pollution, uh, taking less land, uh, and so on. So in fact, uh, a transportation agenda which includes major investments uh, in rail and barge technologies, both for the port and more generally for goods moving through the region, is part of the environmental agenda. Um, and we should, in my view, look at this environmental agenda and that transportation agenda, along with the port development agenda, as a unified agenda. And think about a unified capital budget for the region to move those different agendas forward concurrently. Thank you. <clears throat> this is a great forum, Michael. Thank you for doing it. I think as you are sensing, as you've listened to the other speakers, that we have a chance to make history, uh, which may not always be the case in every one of these forums. We're at a critical moment in the history of the city. We're at a critical moment in the, in the, for the future of the estuary. We're at a critical moment, really, a, a wonderful opportunistic moment where for the first time in a hundred years, so much of the shoreline uh, previously uh, devoted to uh, finger piers, uh, highways, uh, now, f now removed industries are gone. And now through the 760 shared miles of the Hudson, Raritan estuary that we have just described, has been described to you, essentially there are thousands and thousands of acres that you have in your capacity to dispose of. In the summer of 1999, uh, I was part of a team that did a survey for a group of foundations, New York and New Jersey foundations, 
<clears throat> and thanks to meeting Dr. Roberta Weisbrod, uh, who introduced me to some of these port issues. I was aware that summer when the Regina Marisk pulled into New York Harbor virtually unladen because she draws 50 feet and she couldn't get in. And I was astounded that there was no press coverage. And so I called up some friends of mine on the editorial board of the New York Times and said, this is a really significant issue. We're talking here about, as you've heard. <clears throat> and they said, oh, that's a New Jersey story. <clears throat> now, to their credit, I wouldn't have told that story, except for the fact that they did come to grips with it. They did recognize the significance of, of the issue. Shortly after that experience, there was a, a conference pulled together. Many of the people up here on the stage participated in it that attempted to bring together, for the first time as far as I know, citizens from both sides of the Hudson who were actively concerned with, with, with waterfront. Since there are many historians here, I feel no obligation to be accurate. There's a myth <clears throat> that one of the great myths is that one of the dumbest things that ever happened was that the Duke of York, while drunk in order to settle a gambling debt, drew a line down the middle of New York Harbor. Whether that was his motive or not, that was the consequence of creating a political boundary on top of a cultural and geographic one, which has made it extremely difficult for us to operate. So <clears throat> as we now enter this new century, we see that the waters are cleaning up <clears throat> uh, thanks to the Clean Water Act, but there still are enormous problems. Last night when it rained, millions and millions of gallons of raw sewage poured into the, in, in, into the rivers. <clears throat> the, so we thought it would be a good idea to bring the citizens from both sides of the Hudson together the five counties of New York and the surrounding counties in New Jersey to see if they had anything in common. They all had the same issues in common. One is that they were virtually unable to obtain access to the waterfront. And you, you know it wherever you live in New York, whether you live in, in, in Brooklyn or, or Queens or, or even Manhattan, for a long, long time there was virtually no place to get to it. I think Senator Moynihan said he was 12, you know, growing up in the in Hell's Kitchen before he realized that there was a river over, over there. And that's very, been very commonly an experience for people. The, the question of access isn't just the ability to get to the water, but it's, it's looking backwards historically, you see that not only was this a great port, but we were tied together in very, very different ways. <clears throat> and the, the empty highways that are now our rivers were, of course, before trains, before subways, before bridges, before tunnels were our principal way of being in touch. As recently as 1900, there were over 100 ferry lines and steamboat lines that tied the, not only the city together, but the city up the Hudson, the city up, up to Long Island Sound. And those, those connections have been forgotten. And you now look at, at places like Williamsburg or Greenpoint or, or Brooklyn Heights or Red Hook. These were amongst the first places settled long before Manhattan had grown much north of Washington Square. These were settled places. The ferry districts, they were, they were then called. The English and Dutch farmers in the flatlands were absolutely appalled at what happened when the Europeans and other undesirables came and settled in the, in the countryside and changed the politics of, of Brooklyn forever. So what the Metropolitan Waterfront Alliance has tried to do, it's now up to about 300 organizations around the harbor, <clears throat> is to simply focus attention on some of these issues. To get, to build a constituency, unlike the editorial board of the New York Times, that understands that there's not only an economic reason to care about the growth of the port, but there's an environmental, as, as has been stated. If the, if the tonnage that comes in now, 30% of the material that comes into this harbor is aimed for us, if that were to come in is to Philadelphia or Halifax, it would come here by tractor trailer with terrible consequences. So the, our notion has been to simply to try to do a little homework try to get people to have a broader sense of the issues. We have an agenda. 
then we have a target. The target is the election of 2001. For a city that grew up out of the water, we, we, we have the idea that it's unconstitutional to subsidize waterborne transportation. As far as I know, there is, I'll ask the congressman, but I don't believe there's any form of transportation in the United States that isn't subsidized. And here's a form of transportation. Almost everything we want to do in New York, whether it's the Second Avenue subway or the single seat ride to the airport uh, or extending the number seven line costs $2 billion. For about $40 million, we can have local service again to the portions of New York Harbor. And what this shows is a simple, this is just a, I don't want to dwell on it too long, this is a simple loop idea. We have express service, like the number four, be between St. George and Whitehall, you know, ha happens to be subsidized, it happens to be subsidized to the tune of just under $100 million a year, free. <clears throat> this is the express, 5,000 people ride back and forth. What we're saying is let's put in a number six train that will pick up Brooklyn Heights, or pick up Red Hook, a place that's virtually uh, unable, to, has no form of transportation, Governor's Island, the Brooklyn Army Terminal, uh, Stapleton, et cetera, et cetera. There are two ferry routes that I'm showing you here just as an idea. Uh, my purpose in raising this, incidentally, isn't that you should adopt it, but that I think that New York's genius has been its entrepreneurial spirit. It's Jeremiah Thompson's, it's uh, Constantine Sidiman Aristotle's, it's Jerry Nadler's, the people who have brought forth new ideas. And these are the, the kind of thinking that we need. So we're just trying to prime the pump a little. <clears throat> There's two ideas here. One is to connect the burgeoning areas where development is occurring with local ferry service to provide for the first time access to sit to places like Red Hook, for instance, which has no form of public transportation, where every other neighborhood in the city has a growing population, Red Hook continues to decline. How many people here have been to Red Hook? Fabulous. <laughs> there are more people who have been to Red Hook than there are in Red Hook. <clears throat> so you know, you know about the, uh, the, the, the wonderful views there. The second thing that's shown here is a way of connecting another of our assets which is the great collection down here, you see Gateway. We had the vision to create, a few years ago, a great national park near New York, 25,000 acres, and yet no one can get there. No one's ever been, hardly anyone, to Fort Wadsworth. Very few people go to Sailor's Snug Harbor. As the port grows, we need a constituency for it, and what the reward should be in return is that the Port Authority and that the, and, and that the economic growth here sustain the transportation, the revitalization of the waterfront, the, the sensible use of public space along the waterfront to return what is New York's greatest asset back to the people. Thank you. <clears throat>
together presented what seems to be the framework for a sensible discussion on how to, in fact, reconcile these things. And there seems to be a common ground of understanding that they are not, in fact, inherently uh, antagonistic. There may be people not at this table who think that, but uh, I suspect that's not the, the, the uh, critical concern either. Uh, another thing that flows out of the historical discussions that we've had is that there's two dimensions to New York City's historical approach to its port. Um, the most profound one, uh, as has been mentioned, is a system of, well, uh, to call it public-private collaboration is, is kind of anachronistic. Uh, there had been, however, for all the entrepreneurialism of individual uh, 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 players in this, for instance, the people who uh, threw up the Atlantic docks across the way in uh, Brooklyn, which were a spectacular new uh, development, uh, almost on the model of London docks, once the Manhattan piers, which were usually shoddy, thrown together, lots of dead horses and old carts in them. Uh, on the other hand, that meant they were so dirt cheap you didn't have to charge much uh, for loading and unloading on them. So that was a private venture. On the other hand, the city is most dramatic in the state for its public initiatives, starting, of course, uh, with the Erie Canal, but also going to things like, for instance, the consolidation of the city itself in 1898, one of the major forces that, in fact, worked to uh, mobilize this alliance between Brooklyn and Manhattan and the other uh, many of the other places perched around the periphery of the harbor was the strong conviction particularly by the business elite of the city, the merchants who were still at the helm, as it were, in the 70s and the 80s of the Chamber of Commerce, who said, this is lunatic. The harbor is something that must be developed collectively and for the good of all. Its problems transcend the political jurisdictions which now, in fact, divide it. Let's overcome that, at least to the degree that we can, uh, given the Duke of York's screw up uh, uh, all those many years ago. So there is this tradition of active intervention, of thinking through the port as a tremendous resource which must be developed and it must in fact be done in some sort of tandem between public and private sector. Where'd that go? Why hasn't that been as operational in the last, you know, say half century? So let me, uh, uh, with that, uh, turn it over to you folks, and you can uh, basically uh, please grab a mic when uh, you want to get on, uh, and I'll, I'll play moderator, but feel free to jump in. Yes. First of all, the, there is one form of transportation in the United States that is not subsidized, and that's rail freight. Rail freight is not subsidized. Passenger rail is subsidized. Every other form of transportation is subsidized, except for that. Second of all, I forgot to mention one other aspect of the tunnel proposal, which is that it would very quickly get one million tractor trailers a year off New York City streets, which has a good environmental impact, to put it mildly. Third, third, when you talk about the 1929 uh, uh, first master plan and a lot of other things, New York City and New York State government have followed a whole series of policies that either by, by, by de depending on you, if you believe, uh, uh, conspiracy theories of some books, or if you just think it was stupidity, have, have been designed to expel manufacturing from New York. We have been losing manufacturing jobs at a rate six times the national rate of job loss over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. I'll give you one example, one very, very relevant example. In the late 1960s, all the railroads that served the Northeast were going bankrupt one by one essentially because the federal government was subsidizing their competition in the form of the interstate highway system. Um, and they were going to stop operating. They were going bankrupt. This caused two crises, one of which government res responded to, one of which. One crisis was that what we today call the commuter railroads were going to stop going. They were the, the, what we now call the Long Island Railroad is part of the Pensy system and so forth. And the white collar workers who live in the suburbs wouldn't be able to get to their jobs in New York City. Rockefeller stepped in, the other people stepped in, and uh, they formed the MTA, and they essentially nationalized the commuter operations, or, or governmentalized it, whatever, whatever you want to call it, and set up what we now know as Metro North New Jersey Transit and the Long Island Railroad. The second crisis was that the uh, railroads, were, as I said, were going bankrupt. They were stopping the floats. 1968, over 300,000 uh, uh, rail cars had floated across the harbor on barges. 1969, it went from 300,000 to 5,000. Last year, it was 7,000. So essentially, it stopped like that. Uh, and, if you st and this meant that the 
Raw materials for New York City industry couldn't get in, the goods couldn't get out, and we lost, within a five-year period, 250,000 blue-collar jobs that we would not have lost otherwise, and nobody noticed. Now, why has the Port Authority been such an impediment as it has over the decades to improving? Uh, I think we've had two major problems, aside from gross ignorance on the part of most government officials of this general problem. One, Port Authority had a sunk investment in New Jersey, in Port Newark and Port Elizabeth, and regarded any proposal uh, to, to revive port facilities in New York Harbor, especially in Brooklyn, as competition. And uh, the New York City and state governments, the congressional delegation, slept soundly through it and didn't notice. No one said anything. Congress approved the final assistance plan, and Conrail then took the classic monopoly, monopolist attitude. They have major investments on the, east, on the west side of the Hudson River. They took the classic monopolist attitude to the largest freight market in the world, east of the Hudson River, and said, you bring your stuff to us by truck over the George Washington Bridge at great expense to you, we'll take it from there. No competition. We're, we're starting to be liberated from this only because Conrail, uh, the, the so-called merger, which was really Conrail dissolving and its assets being purchased by two competing railroads, CSX and North, Norfolk Southern, in the last two years, which is just breaking up this pattern and we can begin um, uh, to deal with this again on a, on a, on a more rational basis. Um, I don't uh, want to particularly be a defender of the Port Authority. Uh, the, the sort of objective uh, region-wide uh, side of me says, it doesn't seem to me that Brooklyn is the way to go. 350 acres you're going to have to carve out from someplace. It's going to take seven to 10 years to build it. It's going to be $1.8 billion. Uh, within that 10 years, the uh, choice of a hub port, uh, if in fact that's uh, a reasonable uh, way to think about the problem, a choice of one hub port, um, is going to be uh, well along the line. Uh, I guess one way I'd put it is, uh, if, uh, if a member of Congress as sharp and as knowledgeable as, uh, as uh, the congressman to my left uh, had the New York region as his district, he would be strongly advocating uh, Bayonne, not uh, Brooklyn. Well, and the problem is there isn't anybody over in Bayonne who's nearly as sharp as he is. But so that's the political issue, I think. No, that, it is not. Right. I've, I've got to reply oh, to that. Well, you want to the reply? Let the Congressman respond, but then... Yeah. Uh, quite, then quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. I have been advocating Bayonne for 10 years, as well as Brooklyn. The Port Authority finally caught on about three years ago. They were opposed to New York Harbor. I have advocated New York Harbor because of the depth uh, before you hit Solid Rock. I believe we also desperately need Brooklyn. And one of my concerns now is that because of the local politics and commercial operations of Bayonne, they may not get that ready in time at all. Well, on that optimistic note, thank you so much for coming.